live yet. Probably there should be about a 10 second delay. I should probably hit mute so I don't hear myself talking. There we go. So it says we're live. Hopefully there's no echo. There's not on your end. Okay. I just muted my computer and this is all, you know. Welcome to one fantastic be. week. I mean, we like <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> the rock show. Okay, so we should be fine now. Uh, I'm gonna make sure my autofocus is not on because it will just make me. Uh oh, give me one second. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Oops. Love you too. Good time. All right. Hi, everyone. Okay. Hello. So, uh, welcome to the second ever. Uh, artist hangout, uh, at least hosted by myself. Uh, last month, we did this with Bruce Bernaisi. And this month, I've got my good friend Carla Moreau, who's also another dragon watercolor artist. And we'll be answering random questions for the most part, basically just possibly shooting the breeze with each other, uh, unless somebody <laughs> jumps in into the chat and gives us some questions but I've got a couple like kind of preloaded questions that we can start with uh if there's no one who shows up and then we'll just go from there and just see where the conversation takes us sounds good so hi Carla hello how are you <clears throat> uh so let's start I did my intro about like where I started with art and everything. Uh, so for those who are just now joining us, um, at least my patrons would already know this, but Carla's patrons might not have heard of me yet. Um, uh, I do watercolor, uh, but also digital work. I work mainly in fantasy. So I do a lot of dragons, but I also do other fantasy creatures and things like that. Um, I grew up in Montana and I'm also a independent, fully independent artist. So that means I don't work for a company and I don't do like a uh, freelance work or anything like that. Uh, so Carla, how about we start at the beginning and get a full intro from you. Tell us maybe like where you grew up and how you got into art and how you got to the point that you are here cool. now. Yeah, absolutely. Carla Morrow, uh, pretty much mainly a dragon artist, uh, dragonladyart.com, that's me. Um, I've done solely dragons for uh, probably 15 years or so now. I grew up in Las Cruces, New Mexico. It was a small town at the time. It's grown a lot bigger. And I since moved to a nicer area. At least it's prettier. Um, and yeah, I have was always an uber nerd. <clears throat> always into fantasy and, you know, the typical all of us 80s kids have the same, you know, influences of the last unicorn and labyrinth and all of that kind of good stuff. So when the, when fantasy first started to go mainstream in the eighties, I was on that, that first, you know, first wave, which was pretty cool. Um, I always knew I wanted to be an artist, you know, probably I was, I think it was eight or nine when I made the decision that that's what I was going to be. Art ran in the family. Uh, I had numerous aunts and uncles and grandfathers and grandmothers and whatever that were all artists. Um, I was surrounded by art books all the time. My grandmother had stacks of art books and I've since inherited all of them, which is cool. Uh, yeah, I started doing dragons probably when I was in high school and I did other fantasy creatures and I am open to doing other fantasy creatures and I have plans for others. But as of right now, the dragons are pretty much the main bulk of what's going on. I, uh, I'm also independent. I don't really work for any companies or anything like that. I have, uh, several licensing deals, licensing contracts, stuff like that. And I don't, um, I don't do what they tell me. <laughs> I just do my own stuff and then they accept it, which is cool. So yeah, that's where we're at now. I do shows. I do comic book conventions, Renaissance fairs, all that kind of good stuff. Um, Patreon, sell online. Yeah. And I know this question is going to come up because it does every single time. Is did you go to school for art? <laughs> Not officially. Um, mm -hmm. When I was in high school, the art teacher was very, very limited. We only had one. And we didn't get our second art teacher until I was a sophomore or a junior. So I couldn't even take art in high school until I was a, a junior. So, yeah. And then I, <clears throat> I went to college for two months and realized this is not for me. So I dropped out of college. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me. I met my 
now husband, then boyfriend uh, when I was 17. And his mom was a professional artist. So she took me under her wing. I was, um, she taught me from drawing on the right side of the brain and she was also doing watercolor. So I, I learned several watercolor techniques from her and she took me to shows too, which was cool. So I got a commission. Um, I got to learn the business side, how to talk about art, how to, you know, see if people are really interested in what you're doing versus ones that are just, you know, looking to waste some time with some questions and stuff. And that right. kind of so, thing. so it was in- cool. Instead of being unlucky enough to waste tens of thousands on art school you yes. had a really good mentor I did exactly really ideal that's good yes. yeah <laughs> she introduced me to several other artists that I got to learn from and talk to and stuff like that which was cool it was all southwestern genre so it wasn't fantasy but that's all right it all seemed to have accumulated I think it worked out like cool yeah because uh gosh if like after going to college like you know we we didn't get that chance to branch out and meet like actual professionals like we were kind yeah. of told that but we, we really weren't um right so well, it's it's really actually- funny now to see like <clears throat> in the fantasy market I felt I always felt like I was missing something because I wasn't on like the live journal boards like a lot of the other fantasy artists and I missed that whole thing I didn't get in on the first wave of conventions it wasn't until about 10 years ago before I actually started doing conventions so I missed that and and whatnot and it's it's funny to listen to a lot of the fantasy artists now talk about like doing fine art shows and how to prepare their work for fine art shows and, and doing upper level prints, you know, which would have been Jaclay's, you know, 15, 20 years ago and stuff like that. So now that, now that the rest of the fantasy market has caught up, I feel like I'm a little bit ahead of the game when five years ago, I felt like I was behind the ball. You yeah, know? It's how that works out. And actually mm-hmm. we, we started doing conventions about the same time, didn't we? Uh, uh, I think so. I think you've been doing them a little longer than I had. Because okay. ND, that first NDK was like, that was my first year of conventions. So that was like 2008. I think I mm-hmm. started 2007 or so. Okay. Uh, and I remember seeing you at NDK too, which is crazy because <laughs> we didn't really know each other then. Like uh-uh. we, we had just met and then like we figured it out like afterwards. Like, hey, I remember seeing you at NDK. Like, I remember that booth yeah <clears throat> and it wasn't until like the following year or something where we actually <clears throat> goodness <clears throat> excuse me yeah met up uh, thought, booth to booth <laughs> I like specifically remember that they had some sort of thing going on that year in the artist alley where people were able to like vote on their favorite booths yeah and they kept coming up like several people came up to my booth and they were like, are you the dragon lady? And I'm, <laughs> I didn't know I had this title, but I'm confused, but I guess so. I, actually, I didn't know that you had actually had that name. So I was like, I don't, I guess. Uh, she- uh, <laughs> my power just went out. Holy cow. Holy crap, dude. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> Do you need to, so my you need to go check out. on it? I'm going to, I, no, 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 no. I'm just going to, you can actually see me. So I'm just, just going to, I'm on my phone and not on the computer. Sorry, guys. Although I can't see That's actually questions amazing. whatsoever now. So yes. Okay. I can still hear you. I'm inside of my house. Okay. Once I get into tour, tour. Area, I know, right? My messy house. <laughs> Let me open a window here. That is, ugh. We all have a messy this house. is small town, <clears throat> small town, New Mexico. We tend to lose power randomly. So. Maybe I'll get that nap in anyway, because I sure as heck can't do any work. Move it. Get my dog out of the oh, chair. Oh, wow. Okay. So now I'm in front of a window, which so you least should be able to see me. <laughs> okay. Sorry, guys. Random power. Oh, good. I can hear you. So I mean, we're good here. Okay. So can you let's see, see me? I'm... Sorry, I might be a little blown out now, but. It's fine. It's fine. Yeah. Okay. No worries. Uh, I'm going to do is I'm going to look in my queue because it looks like we don't have any questions from Patreon. And for those that are probably watching this next week when this goes live on my YouTube channel, uh, patrons are seeing this live. So yeah. patrons at the $5 and up levels are the ones that see these streams live so that they can interact with us while we're doing these. So if you do want to get in on this stream, you can pledge to... Uh, so far, I'm hosting, uh, but for future hosts and interviews, and I'm sure this is not going to be the only time that Carla and I might do this, uh, at the $5 and up levels, you can get access to the live streams. And then next week, 
public YouTubers can see this. So that's where I'm getting these questions from. Uh, but I don't think anyone is online at the moment. So I've got kind of a preloaded subject that we can talk about. Cool. <clears throat> Sorry. This is my Boston Terrier, Libby. She's insisting on being in my lap. Okay. <laughs> oh, pups. She's like, you're in my chair. I'm going to sit in your lap. <laughs> okay. So one of the questions that, like, we both get asked a whole bunch is how long have you been doing art, right? At conventions, oh, yeah. at least yeah. about 15 times. Yep. Um, I think we kind of covered that a little bit when we, when you started with, well, My probably for sure. forever, right? So yeah. I think we can probably kind of skip that one because it's one of those where I think people just want to figure out I don't know why that question gets asked. I hope somebody in chat jumps it's, in. And tells me. It's interesting because it's it's that one and it's how long did this piece take you? And I, I don't know if they, I don't want to say they don't know what they're asking because that's not entirely true. But, <clears throat> you know, we've been, we've been painting and drawing our whole life. So it's not, it's not that we work on this one piece. It's that we've been working on pieces since we were very, very young. So it's the, ti the time that it takes to do that piece plus all of the background time that it right. took to get to that skill level to do that piece. It's the accumulation so, of building the skill and then exactly put into the piece. The like 10,000 hours plus the piece we just did. Yeah, so, I yeah. think a lot of folks kind of forget that like, okay, if I try to drew, drew something at a certain level of detail, like six mm. years ago or something, yeah. and that piece would have taken me 10 hours to do. If uh -huh. I tried to do that piece now with six more years of experience, it might only take me four or five hours to do. It most. Exactly. So yeah. that's how the skill accumulation kind of works. It's like I figured out how to work faster and smarter, and stronger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was it was crazy because I did I was hired by Hay House to do the first Oracle deck that I did. And they had I had six months to do 44 paintings. And I, I had to scale way back down on the detail. Um because it, it's, you know, that's, that's a lot of freaking artwork, but you know, it ended up, ended up taking about eight or nine months. And the difference between my work before I started and after I started just cranking out that much work and that much paintings day after day after day. I remember that. It was so, like to the roof, like my abilities. It was cool. I remember by the time you got to uh, paintings later in the series, you look back in the first ones of the series and you're like, yeah, you do some of these now. Wow, some of those you, suck. <laughs> you gained so much skill just in that short amount of time mm -hmm. because of the amount of work that you did that you can actually yes. <laughs> see yes. the progress in such a short amount of time because you're painting like, like one of how many per day were you doing? Is it like one every other day or something? Something like that. Yeah. By the Easy. time I got to the last few months, I was painting four to five paintings a week. Yeah. Because hey, with drawing, Rebecca. and then I had to get all the drawings. Hello. We got Rebecca in the chat. Awesome. Hey, here's a good question for you, Carla. How did you okay. decide to start on dragons? Where did your oh, dragon cool. obsession come from? Let's talk about that. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> a lot of it was started with the uber geekdom. Like, again, I was into unicorns. I was into last unicorn, the movie and all that other kind of stuff. And <clears throat> I always felt in high school that dragons were kind of neglected. So that's when it started. And then as I started doing research about them, I realized that dragons are in every culture in the world. So there's right. something about them that connects us all on like a subconscious level for some reason like everybody connects to dragons and you're starting to see that now I mean even in our, our modern myths and legends Harry Potter how to train your dragon you know these are these are modern myths and legends that we're currently creating and dragons are still playing this huge part in it despite being you know a thousand years later that I would also argue this phenomenon kind of happened where somewhere in the late like not like 2004, maybe it was the early 2000s, but before then, like the only time you ever saw a dragon of anything was like maybe Melody Pena's work. Uh, you yeah. might see her sculptures, but other than that, you would only ever see dragons on like men's over shirts, like right. at all. And they were always like the Chinese dragon style. You never yeah. saw any other type. Um, they weren't in movies. They weren't or in like- Or 70s anything. van art dragons. Yeah, like, so they weren't really 
part of pop culture yet. They weren't accepted mm -hmm. into pop culture enough that, I mean, like I was dying as a, like as a kid for a good dragon movie. But right. every dragon movie that was ever produced, they were like, <laughs> they were like the super <laughs> fat round ones with like tiny, yeah. they were like the dorky, cute, right. kidsy ones. And I, yes. I wanted just like a realistic one that could fly, like had wings big enough to fly around. Right. And I, I think, think um, Drake, I think Dragonheart, Dragonheart was the big tipping point for a lot of people. And even then, I still hear that. I mean, that movie's been out twenty years now, and I still hear it's still holds it's my up. my favorite movie. You know? Yeah, exactly. Sean Connery plays a great dragon. <laughs> he does. <laughs> it's the voice. That movie, when it came out, it was like my heart and soul. Like I was right? so obsessed <laughs> with that movie. And yeah, but that wasn't really like. I think that it was actually the Dragon Riders of Pern that did it for me. Okay, yeah. So I can I can uh, thank my sister for that because she was actually into the book. She was like part of that like book club thing, yeah. like, get a book every month or week or something like that. And so right. she read the books, and then like you know I got the books after she did, and I was able to. Get you know, I I never got into the books, and I was a huge fantasy reader buff, but. It, after my first couple of shows, when everybody would come into my booth and go, oh my gosh, these remind me of the Pern Dragons. I had more than one occasion a guy that would just sit in my booth for hours and tell me the entire storyline of all the Pern books. Oh, so I got to the point yeah. where I'm like, I'm not going to read these. And I've since read one or two of them and they're really That's good and I enjoy them. <laughs> yeah, they're... <laughs> He was really nice, but that. it was like I would get busy with customers, and he would just stand off to the side and wait, and then we'd come back in and tell me all the. And I'm like, that's okay, just a dude. that's just like, a business convention, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Booth barnacle before the term came around. Ooh, yeah, so. yeah, for sure. Yeah, like after I I did like the Dragon Riders of Pern. They were definitely more of a mixture between the dragons and like a science fiction, though. And right. I tried getting into science fiction. I read a few of the books, but for me, I didn't have that connection. I'm definitely more of the uh, the magical side of things. Yeah. I like the sorcery and the magic and like that kind of stuff a little definitely. bit more than the science. So, like, I think Aragon was like a huge. I was so excited when I saw the cover of Aragon because it was a dragon on the front cover. And yeah, that just wasn't seen outside of the Pern series and things like that at the time. There wasn't a whole lot of dragon books out. I think and I think uh there's a few series, uh like Mercedes Lackey, I think, was one of them that did a few. I'm about to sneeze, so <laughs> excuse you. me. <laughs> I didn't know she had any dragons. I know because I, I yeah, I know she's got like griffins and stuff like that. Uh, I'm not sure about dragons. Joanne Burton. Of course, I don't know what the timeline is. Uh, yes. Joanne Burton had a few which I were obsessed with because it yep. had people turning into dragons and that was like... I remember that series. I read that maybe about 14 <laughs> or 15 times because I'm like, this is yep. the best thing in the world. That had some, that had some steamy stuff in it. <laughs> it did, yeah. After the dragon, after the dragon became a human. A little bit of something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, yeah, Rebecca is asking, why did you both choose the mediums that you did? And how did you discover and fall into them? Which is perfect, because this is actually the question that I was talking about that we might go into uh, yeah. earlier sometime a few minutes ago. I think I mentioned it. But yeah, since we are both essentially, as far as traditional mediums go, we're both watercolor artists. Right. Um, and I have kind of a meandering way of how I fell into it. So, but let's start with how you chose watercolor and why, I guess, uh, okay. you stick with watercolor. Yeah, yeah. So I originally started out um, working in marker and I did Prismacolor marker for years and I started doing out, well, okay, let me go, if we go further back, <laughs> I started in acrylic and actually my very first business name was Acrylic Dragon and you can still find residuals of that name across the internet. Um, and I, I had the Acrylic Dragon website, I think, back in 99, 2000, uh, way, way, way early. And I, so I, most of my paintings were done in acrylic. I didn't, I didn't care much for, like, the drawing time, and I just never got really the hang of acrylic. So there was another artist who was a comic book artist that I was a big fan of, and he worked in Prismacolor Marker. And I loved his style, and I loved his 
his color gradients and stuff like that. So I saved up my tax money one year and bought the entire, what was it? 120 set of markers at the time. And it was funny because I ordered them from Dick Blick and Dick Blick delivered them to the wrong house. And some, yeah, I drove by and it was, it was where we lived previously. So they just delivered it to my old address. And I went by and there was like a kid's bike and stuff in the mail or UPS guy went by to try to collect it and they refused to give it to him. And I'm thinking there's some little eight year old kid using my $400 of markers <laughs> to color in his freaking coloring books. And I'm oh, not happy, but Dick Blake went ahead and sent me a new set pretty, pretty quick. So um, I was hooked on Prismacolor at that point, the layering and the colors. And I mean, everything was so vibrant and so easy to manipulate and I could use, you know, paper and not have to pull out canvases and, so my footprint for creating got smaller and I was living in a really, really tiny little apartment. And I literally had just my desk to work on and no other space and whatnot. So the jump to marker was awesome. And then I started doing shows and I watched my original fade from the beginning of the show to the end of the show and went, this is not going to work. <laughs> so I started, I did marker for I guess about four or five years and I actually finally just retired my last water or uh, marker piece only like three years ago they were still selling <laughs> so now I've, I've got nothing but watercolor but I moved into watercolor um, probably for the similarities between watercolor and marker I could get those vibrant colors they had the smaller working footprint um, they, they flowed very similar. They mixed similar on the paper. You know, I could still use paper and again, not get into canvases. Um, I could have a smaller selection of, of brushes without having, you know, 30,000 acrylic brushes and things like that. So, and now I just, I love what you can do in watercolor. I love the, the texture and the salts and the, you know, all the different stuff you can do and the layering and, and I'm definitely a total paint junkie. I've got like 160 colors or something like that now. And you definitely don't need that many watercolors. But, you know, I, I have a good show and I'm like, I'm going to buy one more tube of paint in 10 years of that. And, you you know, and you just don't, they're so pigment loaded that you don't use them. I think them. your selection definitely outpaces mine. Even though like, <laughs> I, I like almost cleaned out like a Daniel Smith store when they were going out of business. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, thank goodness there's not one near me because every time I stop in, there was a, I just went through uh, Crucis and there's an art store down there and they were, pun intended, liquidating their M-grams and I did pick up like eight M-gram yeah. tubes. Yes. And I came home and realized I had two of the same, three of the same colors. I was like, darn it. But that's all right. Because they were like, they were like four bucks a tube. If they like and... Amelia's in some day. <laughs> we all have our excuses. You know? Oh yeah, totally, totally. I'm all in little drawers and labels and everything. Yeah, I love my watercolor. Mm. But you know, depending on the color, you you have each each pigment does certain things. So you have like granulating colors and you have staining colors and you have all these other ones. So there's a lot of them where I have like two or three colors that are really really similar, but one is a granulating and one is a staining. So, so when it dries, different it's properties. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Even though they're really, really similar in color. So I, I'm really big into into the textures of the paint and stuff like that. And, you know, of course, I'm a total paint snob. So I only use M. Graham and Daniel Smith. And that's Pro paint. Much it. <laughs> yes, uh, yes. I think, uh, what is it? Is it Holbein? Or there's, uh, there's a couple other, I've I think, heard some good stuff about Holbein. Yeah. You're, it's funny that, like, the entire time you're sitting here telling me about the reasons that you switched and why I'm like taking off boxes for like me too, me too, me too. Right. Like our, our history for how we got to watercolor is remarkably similar. It is crazy. Like even when you said that you started with acrylic because I also started with acrylic because I was oh, like, cool. a, I was a Bob Ross girl. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So of course, like I was like, Oh, I gotta be like Bob Ross. Like I'm gonna, I'm gonna get acrylic. And I like begged my parents for, for paint, even though he used oil paints, uh, the, yeah. the art store told them that like oil paints aren't good for kids. So I basically yeah, right. use an acrylic paint because it's water based and everything, and uh, mm -hmm. you don't have to have like paint thinner. Like back then, you had to use like silk chemicals and stuff for oil paints. So right. yeah, I also started with the acrylic, and then from there, um, <laughs> acrylic all through like middle school, high school. And then from there, I went to college, and in college, they were just like, oh, well, you're in concept art, so you got to use markers. Like, that's what concept artists use, right? So right. we were 
made to buy like a huge set of uh, Prismacolor markers. And then from there, uh, other college going, like some of my uh, friends from there are like, oh, you need Copics because Copics are like the best I thing see, in the world. I always wanted to, like I got my, my Prismacolor set and then a year later people were like, you have to get Copics. And I looked and I was like, I just invested... You know, it was like three or four hundred dollars at the time to get ah, the whole set of prismacolor. They're color. still and three and four hundred dollars. Yeah, for oh, absolutely. <laughs> and looking at the Copics, I'm like, there's just no way, you know. But like, what I, I would, do I wish I had gone with Copics. And um, and honestly, though, like for a while, uh, Prismacolor, they're still really good. Um, they did eventually introduce a brush tip, uh, which did help, and they work okay. exactly like Copics. Uh. Copics, of course, have like the more diluted colors, which is better for layering versus the Prisma, which was crazy bright, like all yes. of them were. Yes. Uh, so like I did invest in Copics because also I was like into anime, you know, oh, yeah. I had to draw my animes. And uh, so you know I, what I, you know what I don't out. miss is using like two or three Prisma color per painting. I chewed through so much markers. Oh my gosh. Because yeah. I painted big, like 16 by 20 marker pieces, which don't do laugh. that. That's insane. Yeah. I was going through two or three markers a piece on some of these pieces. Oh, some of my college projects, oh I went through so many markers and I would like yeah. run out of one color right in uh -huh. the middle of maybe like 1230 yep. at night. And I'm like trying yep. to finish a project and then the color runs out and I'm like, you're dripping, I'm... you're dripping alcohol in the marker to try to revive <laughs> it just that little bit more. Yeah. And this is like, these markers, it's like hundreds and hundreds of dollars I must have spent on these markers. Oh, they're $46 and a piece per marker. If they're on sale sometimes, because yeah, like it's more Google, like Michaels, it's like eight bucks for like one Copic. Yeah. And you know, you're you feel like this is a professional marker, or at least at the time I felt this. Yes, I don't feel yeah. this way now, but well, there's still if, if you're in marker they work, good. they're still professional markers, but they are, but not for for certain but they're not pieces. fine art yeah 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 they're not meant for fine art they're meant for reproduction work which is mm -hmm. not what we were really going no. for no uh, like if you're going to make a marker piece and then the only thing you're going to do is make prints of it or you're going to reproduce it in some other way then right. it's, it's perfectly fine but also i started realizing that markers aside from their extreme expense was they took up so much space like if yes. you wanted to grab markers to go on like just a trip you had to grab like 20 if you wanted any yeah. sort of collection and it'd be like a stack like this big around you would need like two bags yeah yeah um, and you know when when you spend water the watercolor paints we use are really expensive i mean you're talking like anywhere from 12 to 20 dollars a tube but a tube is going to last a hundred times longer than a marker does i have tubes that i bought 10 years ago that i'm not even halfway through with i've, I, been... I've had to replace a couple of tubes but I also did 44 paintings, well, or two Oracle decks. Yeah. I, yeah, I did a hundred and something paintings in a year. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yeah. yeah. This is like my biggest argument that I get in with a lot of, it's, it's, I don't know if it's newer artists, but just artists that are really invested in the markers is that they say, oh, well, professional watercolors are expensive. And I was like, well, if one marker is even five dollars, like at the cheapest, I'm going to Even the cheap. refillable, go, go refillable Copics. You're still you're still paying two to three dollars every time you fill that marker. You may be able to get eight fills out of a twenty dollar container, but yeah, the, yeah, you're, you're spending a lot more so money, um, and they don't go nearly as far as yeah. a, a regular like largest tube. And the most I think I've ever spent on a on a single tube of watercolor was probably like eighteen dollars. Mm -hmm. But I've never run out of that color, and I've been painting yeah. for years. Yep. And I can't say that for any marker I've ever had, even no, no matter how uh -uh. Many I'd use, like for yep. the amount of like large paintings I do, I would run out of marker yeah. for each oh, painting yeah. or yep. more. And even, so, even if watercolors dry in the tube, which doesn't happen very often unless you have a faulty tube, I think my, yep, my power just came back on, um, you, you can still bring it back. You know, you, you can, can. Put the tube open, you can put it in a jar and add water to it and it's going to, it's going to come back pretty quick. So even yeah, with that's the great thing about watercolors. Uh, mm -hmm. They you can revive them no matter how dry they are. So you it's never really fun. lose paint. Like paint never yeah. really goes bad. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've been known to cut open tubes and make sure that, you know, you get every little tiny bit out of it. And just a little tiny bit of paint goes such a long way. Oh, yeah. So 
uh, I mean, it just kind of made sense to switch to watercolor and I did it for the same reasons as you did. Uh, they act a lot like marker. Like if you don't put a whole lot of paint mm -hmm. or water in the paintbrush, it has the same consistency as like a, a wet marker. Yeah. So you have the same amount of control as a marker as well if you know how to use a paintbrush. Um, so there, there really was no downside to switching to watercolor. There was actually a lot more pros than cons. And once uh, I was actually more turned on to watercolor when I sat next to Daniel Govar. Mm -hmm. M-Gram paints. That uh, guy is crazy. Oh, yeah. Holy I said, moly. I, I just, I just met him in, uh, was it Phoenix? Yeah, I met him in Phoenix and then saw him again at Denver. And holy shnikes, that guy's insane. I know, like, I sat next to him at Emerald City Comic Con, and I watched him paint, like, six, yeah. like, paintings of this size just in his with lap. Like, with, like, 12 brush strokes, and he's done. <laughs> I would look over every hour, and he'd be, like, halfway done, and I'm like... I know! Wow, so, yeah, yeah he had m -grams, so he gave me, like, his palette list and everything, and after I watched oh, cool. him do this, and I, I saw how, like, vibrant the paints were, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh my god. Gosh, and all he had was a little palette that was this big. That's yeah. it. And I'm thinking, yep. like, the amount of markers I have at home that I would need to do that, I would need a carry-on suitcase yeah. quite literally to get the range of color because one tube of watercolor is equal to, like, 15 different markers. <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 because the range of color you can get and everything. And that's another That's another big, big part of it is, like, yes. sure, like, one tube of watercolor, say it's 20 bucks. Like that's the highest it gets mm -hmm. versus 14 markers, right? Like at $5 a piece, right? Like that, yeah. that's really the difference there. Your red zero one, your red zero two, your red zero three. And now like all of it is just like, this is literally like my entire palette right here. <laughs> okay, I'm jealous of your palette. <laughs> uh, I don't have to refill it very often, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little bit dirty, but you can kind of, yeah, yep. you can kind of see it there. But this is basically what I use for every single one of my paintings is just this. And like these little trays, I rarely have to refill, to be honest. Um, and those pop in and out. So if you decide that you need colors that you don't have, you can pop them in and out. Yeah, those. I'm actually going to do that for a trip. Some of these are duplicates, like some of the reds and some of the greens. I'm going to pop out one of each of the duplicates and put in a few new colors for when I travel. And like the brushes just sit right in here. So this is literally... This right here alone can replace an entire set of Copic markers. Yep. Like you a 200 can. set, not not like a 20 or 30 set. All of them. And more. Because there's like metallics in here. There's like granulating paints. Yeah. There's more stuff in here than a, any marker can do. Right. Ever. So that's definitely why I switched. And I ended up selling all of my markers. Well, that and also... You and I, we do paintings to sell the originals as well because we're, mm -hmm. we're more fine artists than we are production artists. Right. So like a Copic uh, or a Prismacolor, they're all alcohol markers. So over time, those paintings are going to fade away. Like if you, if you sell the original piece, that person who owns that, like they're going to watch their art disappear over yes. time. Yes. Anything that has a dye base pigment as a base is going to fade as opposed to a regular... Like, what's nice about the watercolors is they're actual, like, ground stones and real pigments and stuff like that, as opposed to dye base, which is usually, um, like, plant and vegetable base, things like that, so. Yeah, so they're going to last a lot longer. They're going to be very light fast, which is uh, something that you definitely want, because once you sell a painting, you want that to last for years and years, like, as long as you yeah. can. Yeah, and it doesn't matter. I mean, I had, I had the special UV glass, I had UV sprays, everything like that, and they still... Yeah. yeah, and also the brand of watercolor is going to make a huge difference. Uh, Rebecca's asking what her favorite brands are. Um, when I first started watercolor, this was before I met Daniel Govar and it was introduced to the um, the M Gram paints, which is a mm -hmm. high grade professional quality paint. Um, I was using like the really cheap, like uh, student grade paints, like the Grumbacher and like the other ones in that series that were like two or two, like two dollars a tube or something. Robert like Nickel or Richard Nickel or something there's like that. A, yeah, there's a few. Something a nickel. Yeah. I was using those. And another thing I, I kind of realized after I switched to Ngram is another comment that you've probably got is, oh, well, I just, I can only afford the cheap watercolors and I hate watercolors. It's so hard to work with. But watercolor 
and this is not true for a lot of artist mm -hmm. mediums, watercolor is one of the very few mediums where you need to invest in the good quality paint or else yeah. you will not ever achieve the look that you want to get because the cheap paints, they're very oh, they're hard to so work with. Different. They mm -hmm. get really gummy. They get dried out. They crack. Like they have it's no not pigment the person. in them. Yeah, it's the paint. It's not. Yeah. The, it's not the artist. Oh, uh, yeah. If you pick up a really good quality paint, you'll tell the difference, and you'll actually be able to achieve the looks you want. So, like, you have to be able to invest in the best quality paints. So, they I have to say started. On I them, started like, in more. koi, koi brand paint, which was an upper student level. It was. It was. It was nice. It's very consistent. Like all of the pigments are all the same consistency and almost like that marker look, which was nice. Um, and then when I first started buying my first uh, Daniel Smith, I don't even remember where I heard about it. But by the time I started working in Koi and working with watercolor, I started to become a bit of a watercolor snob. And I bought like five colors in Daniel Smith. And the first time I used them, I was like, I'm done. This is, this is, this is the end of my rainbow right here. And I got rid of like all of my koi paints and I replaced everything with Daniel Smith. And again, with Daniel Smith, you have the granulating colors, you have the, the color shifting where they have one, two with like four different colors and one is a granulating and one is a staining and one is a floating. So they all separate out and you can get these really, really cool effects. And you just couldn't get that with, with a lot of the other student grade brands because they're so consistent. They all lay down the same. They all lay down the same tone. They all lay down. And a lot of them, they and... don't blend very well either. Mm -mm. Yeah. Koi wasn't too bad about blending it. Thank goodness. But it, it, yeah. Once, once I hit Daniel Smith and I, I bought a few colors of M gram and now M grams base is honey, which is really cool. But the downside is, is I tend to be really thick with my watercolors so if I use them too thick, they will remain sticky. They get gummy. They yes. Get gummy. So as, as much as I love the pigment and I love the color, and if you use your watercolors really, really washy, definitely try out M. Graham and to, to, uh, try out some of their colors. Some of their colors are a little bit more vibrant than even Daniel Smith. But that, that honey binder just – and I and I and where I live is kind of humid, so it takes longer to dry, and yeah. they, they will crack in the palette and stuff like that. And that's just because of where I live and whatnot. So – yeah, I have a few M. Graham colors, and I really like M. Graham. I just, because of my painting style, they're not the best for me. I think so. uh, I, I do like my M. Grahams. Uh, I mostly moved into Daniel Smith just because they have such a huge variety. Yes. Uh, and it's that like... That dot card, that dot card is just the worst. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you basically go into the store, and you're like, I got this one, and this <laughs> is like Pokemon, and we're like just collecting them all. Oh, yeah, yeah. I have a code, like a little X, I have it, and a little circle is I want it, so I can pull out my dot card and I can see exactly, you know, what my next order is going to be. Yeah, and I think I'm, though, I will say that as, as tempting as it is to get more colors, I feel like I'm finally at that point where I've got the range of colors that I need, because some of them mm -hmm. get so similar that it's like, well, I could paint yeah. from this out of the tube, or paint from this color out of the tube, or I could just take this color and add a little bit of blue and get that other color. Right, right it would be the same thing. So I think I'm at that point yeah. where the, the only colors I would get is anything that has like a metallic shade or any sort of color shifting or a duochrome. Super stuff like that. Yeah. Any of those are going to be what I'm going for because I just want those, those texture variations right now. That good. Right. Yeah, texture. exactly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Rebecca, so we, we went over our favorite brands. I think we can agree that Daniel Smith <laughs> is kind of our jam. He's king. Uh, how do you feel about painting feathers? It doesn't bother me. Like it's, you know, I started dragons and for the first God, like 10 years, I kept trying to find cheats. Like, how are they doing these scales? And they, they're obviously cheating on how they do these scales. And it's the same thing with feathers, the texture and the overlay and everything like that. And, and eventually you get to the point where there is no cheats. You just have to do it. And the more you do it, the faster you get. So like painting feathers doesn't bother me. Um, I have tons of books on painting birds and painting feathers. And, and I have whole Pinterest boards filled with feathers. And I've always loved birds and raptors. Um, I do a lot of, as a palette cleanser, when I get... Um, stuck on what to paint or things like that I usually do a wildlife and pencil and one of the things I do a lot of is owls and raptors and things like that so feathers and scales are pretty much the same for me 
um, you just got to paint them one at a time and there's no other way around it. I'm pretty, yeah, the the best shortcut is practice. (laughs) Yeah, exactly, exactly. (laughs) Um, I'm actually the same way. Uh, I mean, like, we obviously both do a lot of dragons and, like, uh, fantasy stuff, but Mm -hmm. we have a pretty extensive background in fine art uh, with wildlife as well. Um, Back when I first started doing acrylic, um, I was into the, uh, doing the junior duck stamp competition, so I was painting a lot of waterfowl, a lot of ducks and like some geese and stuff. So I learned early on that when it comes to feathers, you just have to make sure they're layered. You, mm-hmm. you use your pencil and you make sure they're layered right. And then you just paint each one individually. One at a time. Yeah. One at a time. And I included like every little, like there's the shaft of the feather and then mm-hmm. everything coming out of it. And I spent hours doing that. And that's just what, it's, it's just how you did it. Like there wasn't, like when it comes to art, it's just something that takes time. Like that's just it. I mean, yeah. with watercolor, I mean, there's also a lot of range of watercolor styles. A lot of people will do the really suggestive, like blotch. Two brush stroke, yeah. Yeah, there's that style as well. And I guess we would do more of, we're more of a, a tighter, detailed, realistic style, I guess. Yeah. It's funny that it's, it's actually looked down on in a lot of watercolor circles. Like it that. is, um, yeah. Yeah. detail artist <laughs> that's, that's the is this, that I, I get asked I get asked all the time if my work is digital and people are always blown away that it's acrylic or a uh, watercolor I'm like nope it's watercolor and they're always like amazed because you're used to seeing the washi and the, the broad strokes and that's things like true. that and, that's that's kind of yeah. like the general way that uh the main population I guess sees watercolor is like oh you can obviously tell when it's watercolor because there's like weird hard edges and then it's like soft in the middle and it's like splotches everywhere Mm -hmm. and that's just the stuff that gets like mass produced and shows up in stores that's what everyone is like familiar with seeing they don't realize that watercolor you can be very very tight and detailed with it and if you layer it right it'll look just like any other vibrant painting yeah i use it pretty much like acrylics i mean that's that's where the background in acrylic shows up is is that's how i use my watercolor the downside is I, I use a higher pigment load and whatnot. So I tend to go through watercolor a little bit faster than a lot of other people, but it's, yeah, I would have it no other way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you just, you just do it the way that you do it. I mean, how are you going to change that? And there's no reason why you should change that just because someone else thinks that a oh, watercolor is supposed to look like this. That's like yeah. the reason why uh, I, cause I use white acrylic paint to add. Um, oh yeah, absolutely. My yeah. Acrylic or gouache. Mm-hmm. And I use like a really thick, heavy body body white paint, which is actually whiter than the watercolor paper itself. Yeah. So it gives it that extra white, like, uh, pop, yeah, a little highlight or actual texture of waves. Because I like it to stand off the paper a little bit, Mm -hmm. which is something that you're not supposed to do in the watercolor world. And I really don't care because, like, it's just, it's a mixed medium at that point. But as long as you get the look that you want, I don't see why we're not like allowed to do certain things like yeah. uh, like <laughs> the way that we mount our paper now. Right. Cause you're doing the same thing yeah. I'm doing where mm-hmm. we take it's it not under glass. It's mounted on a board. Yeah. So you're doing yeah. basically this here yeah. where that's exactly what you got the board and then there's the paper mounted on it. And then mm-hmm. the color here and this painting here, I'm going to spray coat it and then I'm going to mm-hmm. varnish it. So there's going to have a varnish on the front of that which is a huge dono in the, the upscale yes, the fine art watercolor world. I would yeah. never be considered uh, eligible to enter any sort of watercolor. Any which is, is funny because none of the, none of the shows I've ever done have put limits on how you have to present and show your paint, your paintings. Like, I don't know, like when somebody said you may not be able to get into a lot of watercolor shows, I was like, what? Oh, like, really? it did, like I couldn't even, yeah. Cause none of them are like that them. here. Hmm. I don't I I mean we have a lot of art festivals and a lot of fine art festivals and stuff like that around here but they're not yeah they're not limiting on how you know mm-hmm. watercolor only works if it's under glass and washy and yeah I don't know hmm. it's interesting when I started hearing that you know people couldn't get into watercolor shows because they painted on board and sealed their watercolors yeah. or because they used acrylic over the top I just I don't yeah, know I was make any told. sense to me I was told on a few of my videos on YouTube that I wasn't supposed to do it. And I'm like, well, I don't, I don't understand why not. Because like, 
oil painters seal their water. Like they don't, well, they seal their oil paintings. Right. right. Why can't I seal watercolor? Because I'm using the most highest quality acid-free archival materials to do so. Yeah. And like, I'm not introducing some sort of like element into the painting that's going to ruin it technically. Like if anything, adding the varnish to my watercolors, like it makes them so much more vivid that when I brought one of my varnish pieces, this one here actually, I brought this to um, to a LuxCon. And of course the, the sun just came out a little bit. So everything's like <laughs> blown out. But this painting here, when I brought it to a LuxCon, people kept saying, holy crap, that's watercolor? Are you sure? Yeah. And I'm like, it, yeah, yeah it I painted it. <laughs> it's just uh, the varnish just adds so much more dimension to it. And like, I don't think I'd go back because I like not having the glass on there because it just obstructs yeah. all the good yeah. details that we spend time putting in there. So well, and I don't think Whatever. people realize that there's a bunch of different kinds of varnish now. Like I use an acrylic based varnish. I use a water based varnish as yeah. opposed to an oil based varnish, which yes, when you mix oil and water together, that's not going to work well. That's why you don't do yeah. watercolor and oil paintings at the same time. And maybe that's what they're thinking of is that, you know, you varnish oils because it's an oil based varnish, but they like, I seal mine with an acrylic matte media mm -hmm. and not with, you know, a oil based varnish. So I think it's a, it's maybe a lack of understanding of what tools are available now. And the, and the varnishes and the paints and everything are so much more advanced from even, even 10, 15 years ago. Oh you yeah. Know, it's crazy. And the spray varnish that I use is by Golden and mm -hmm. it actually says watercolor. Like yeah. it, it can be used on watercolors. Like so mm -hmm. professional, Golden is a very, very professional brand as well. And if they say it's good for watercolors, it's acid free, it's archival, like obviously they're intending it for this use. So yeah. they know that people are gonna put it on their watercolors. And so I use the spray varnish to seal it and then the liquid varnish again, a water. That's what I do the same thing on top of that so it doesn't smear and people are like mm -hmm. well shouldn't it smear and I'm like well if you spray it a few times and make sure it dries between each coat it's actually pretty solid it's not nothing's gonna happen just don't like take a brush and just you know yeah <laughs> don't scrub it yeah. really hard nothing's gonna happen to it um right. uh let's see I'm gonna see if there's any questions okay so Rebecca's uh, asking did you always know you wanted to be an artist or was it something you discovered later on? This is easy for me. Yeah, me too. Always, 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 always. always. There was never, you know, you're in kindergarten and you draw those, where are you going to be in five years and 10 years and 15 years? And it was always at a drawing desk. Always. There was never, I don't think I could do anything else. And even when I entered the job market, I have had five other jobs in my entire life. And I usually stick with a job and, and I'm currently in a bookstore and I've been there 10 years and I'm about to leave the bookstore because business is finally well enough that I can do so. Um, I don't work under people well at all. Like I don't, I don't handle bosses well. I don't, I have really good work ethic. I show up on time. I do above and beyond what I need to do and all that other kind of stuff. But the people dynamic at jobs, like I couldn't, I couldn't be happy just doing a 95, nine to five and then painting in my spare time. I tried that. It does not work for me. I have yep. to be my own boss. That's just my personality. I'm fortunate that my current boss is very uh, lenient with me as far as like what I do at the bookstore and things like that. I'm pretty much left on my own. I can do whatever I want as long as, you know, X amount of work is getting done, stuff like that. So she's she's been the one I've been able to tolerate the most. But I worked, you know, like everybody else and everybody should work in food service or some kind of service for at least a couple of years. Yeah. So you know how terrible people are. Um, I worked in food service and I freaking hated it. I could it not. It gives you a good sense of customer relation though. So now that you can take your, yes, it does. your current job. Right. Like, I think uh, it would be good to, to kind of mention that like the type of work we do as independent artists, like we both do a lot of conventions, which means that we're basically selling our work directly to our customers. Mm -hmm. There's no, there's no galleries. I mean, there there can be galleries, and there are a few galleries that might. There's a few fantasy galleries now, but that's only been in the like when I first started painting fantasy in the late '90s, early 2000s. Mm -hmm. Everybody told me that I shouldn't do it. Like I shouldn't, I shouldn't paint dragons. Like dragons are never going to sell. You know, you need to do something wildlife or something like that. Or you know, if you want to become a professional artist, don't do fantasy. You know that kind of stuff. Yeah, I heard that too. Yeah, and even even now, I mean, I was just talking to somebody 
earlier who was like, you know, I want to see you, I want to see you paint something from, from your soul, from your heart. And I'm like, it would still be dragons. I think you're underestimating the amount of nerd that I am. Like you underestimate how many dragons are in me. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Trust me, there's a lot more. And if, if I wasn't, you know, I'm not painting dragons for licensing because that's the in thing. And you, and it's funny because every time that comes up on another certain podcast that we watch about, you know, you just want to paint dragons because they're cool. And it's like, mm, no, you know, uh huh. Yeah, that's the same face I get every time it comes up. And I'm like, oh my God. Oh, no, dear. That's, not, that's not it. It's, it's like I said, there's dragons for me go back to that core it's unifying like- element that, also, subconscious type stuff are you gonna so. tell me that like my my like eight-year-old self was all like i better draw dragons because they're going to be big in 20 years <laughs> no 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 in fact in no. fact companies and said i'm a dragon artist here's what i do and they all told me we don't want dragons dragons are not in paint fairies and we'll take them sight unseen and i tried i remember sitting in front of my canvas crying because i was trying to paint a fairy and i couldn't do it and i hated it i have always been a dragon artist well because that's that's like back when like hot topic started carrying like amy brown stuff amy brown jessica Garberth, and amy thomas were the the threesome of top fairy artists and they were everywhere and their work was good and i loved it and i had some of their pieces and i'm not knocking it by any stretch of the imagination but that was like what was was the only thing and that's what every publisher and everyone wanted was like fairies are the in thing therefore yeah. you need to paint fairies and that's like all that's going to sell yep. uh so it had nothing to do with whether or not like we were or like good or bad at what we did it's just like like pop culture follows these certain trends unfortunately yeah. and it's just like as artists we have to always battle against uh what's the trend and what do we really love doing and mm-hmm. i, I thankful luckily that like i at least stuck to my guns and i actually do yeah. loved wildlife obviously you can see there's yeah, like yeah up here there's like a duck painting like mm-hmm. i still love to do that but i would never stop painting dragons because they're just yeah they're just so fun and interesting and there's like a million and one combinations like i you can do anything and they can symbolize anything and they're so yeah. fluid in what you know what you can do with the painting and and you don't they can evoke any emotion that you can set them to and a lot of other creatures and art in general doesn't have that you know Mm -hmm. you can't it's hard to paint an evil duck or a nice duck you know know what I mean it's it's, (laughs) well (laughs) I'm not saying ducks are nice (laughs) I've met some evil ducks but well and the same thing with deer horses or anything I mean you can you can fudge with it a little bit People but then you start getting to into what they are. They don't want them to be yes. different. And though mm-hmm. like a dragon can be anything from like this cute fat child's book dragon to like a huge beast fierce looking fierce yeah. God exactly. dragon. And that's, that's what's so inspiring about them. And if you're not tired of doing the same thing no. after 30 years, I'm pretty sure that's a good sign that you're, I, I just painted 44 butterfly dragons and I have intentions for several, several more. <laughs> yeah. If you can do that and you're going and you're thinking to yourself, Oh hell yeah, let's just keep going. Then it's like, you kind of found your thing at that point. Like there's like, mm-hmm. why try to force yourself into doing something you don't want to do if you've found something that you're happy with. And I think yeah. that's what's really amazing about selling directly at conventions and being an independent artist. Cause we're basically doing what we want to do. Yes, and you can more easily find your tribe. It's and then not people like, can find what connects to them through your yes, art, it's rather exactly. than like you trying to please someone else. Absolutely, based on what you think you should be doing, mm-hmm. and then you're just not happy doing what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. I I would paint dragons even if the you know entire you know world hated them. I just and I did, and I did through the nineties and two thousands. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I I you know I you do get those. You know, are you doing it now because it's trendy? Oh, dragons are in, so that's what you're gonna do now. And I go, no, no, I didn't run to keep up with the the culture. Culture is finally catching up to me. You know, yeah, that's, yeah, I, yeah. No, this is what I've always done, and yeah. and if they phase out from being popular, then I guess and they will. You know, they, everything has yeah. its cycles, but hopefully by then both of us will have enough of a following that those people will be loyal. And, and cause there's always going to be people like that, like fantasy and dragons and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, 
it, it's just always going to happen. My mother-in-law is a Southwestern artist and Southwestern is way down right now, but she still has these collectors and she's still selling despite that fact, because there are people that are not going to follow the trend. They're going to like what they like and that's what they're going to like. So as long as you keep being able to find those people. Um, exactly. Cause like what, what happens if every artist just followed the trend? Like, and then there's people like, I mean me, if I'm thinking, if I'm not an artist, I still love dragons. I would be scouring the internet and everywhere going, where are the dragons that I want? Like, where's this? And we did the early days of the internet. We you know. did. There was nothing. <laughs> we also had a, we had like no connections like we do now. Like the internet was no. not what it no. is now back then. No, 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 like, no, no, no. You were lucky if you could get online and like find some music to like yeah. listen to or something. Yep. But other than I that, remember being so happy when I could go to a search engine and I could put in dragon painting and look through what's now Google images, which wasn't at the time, look through images and I would save them on my hard drive because there were so few of them. You know, you'd only find like 20 or 30 that you liked. Yeah. And now there are millions and millions and millions. Oh, and my, yeah. My best intro to finding images was the early days of DeviantArt. <laughs> yes. Yep. That's where yeah, I got yeah. it. That's where Elfwood. I were you on Elfwood? I was, that was like the upscale DeviantArt. Like, oh, there's like a better DeviantArt, but you know, it's like for better stuff because all the good think, artists go there. <laughs> I think, I think my Elfwood user number is only like four or five digits because I was so early on. <laughs> I think I was yes. in college by the time I figured that one out. But mm. yeah, there was that and then concept art and like, which wasn't really for fantasy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's become, oh. there's a lot more fantasy now, but there wasn't at the time. There, there were, was, fan, there were fantasy magazines though. Yes, the the, the zines. The I would cut zines. out the pictures. There'd be, mm -hmm. be like advertising a print or something, yeah. and then I would cut out that picture from the ad. Oh, like I would pyramid like pyramid collection, and there was a dragon one that was put out by Pyramid Collection, and that's you want to talk. Okay, you want to talk about how big into dragons we are? My husband and I's whole wedding theme was dragons. There's dragons on my wedding ring, which we got from the mail order catalog. Um, and it was dragon something, and I can't remember it. But yeah, yep. Good so, stuff. I'm going to jump in the chat. Oh, hi, Laura. Hello, Laura. Uh, what if, So Rebecca had another question. What have Good. been some of your favorite moments as an artist? Oh, gosh. Mine have always been dealing with my collectors and the people that have that connection. You know, there's there's like a a tingling in the air when somebody comes up and they completely get the work and they ask questions and you can kind of seek them out. And I'm, I'm unabashedly pagan and was growing up and I'm into like the energy work and stuff like that. Not, not as far into it as some other people, but I, I do think that the pagans have it right. And I think as science catches up, um, we'll start seeing that like, they're just now finding out that like trees have energies and stuff like that. And we can pick up on them and stuff like that. So it's cool. And I'm into that kind of naturey kind of from the science side of it but like when people would come in my booth and look around and they lean forward and go you're pagan aren't you and you could tell that they like they keep it on the down low because nobody knew they were pagan so they would buy my work and it's not blatantly like in your face but there's a lot of little imagery and stuff that I chuck that I tuck in um when I came out with the plushy dragons in 2014 the amount of emails that I got from people whose children were autistic and their artistic children loved my stuff. That was like, you know, ugly crying in front of the computer. <laughs> well, they're telling me that, you know, they're having a tea party with my dragons. I'm getting like, yeah, teared up now. Oh. It's really cool. And I did Denver. I was at Denver Comic Con and I had them sitting up. And a young man walked by. And you could tell he was like severely autistic. He had the headphones on. He was, you know, rocking back and forth. And he was like zoning in. And he looked and he patted the dragon on the head. And his mom came up and she's like, do you want that? And he patted it on the head and she just handed me money and he took it and he like, you know, hugged this little dragon. Mm. So that's, those are like big deals for me when people get the work is, is, um, it reminds you why you do it, you know, which is cool. It does. I mean, like, I think that's just like a really good extra for it because obviously we, we do dragons and we do what we do because we just inherently love creating as well. Mm -hmm. but it really reinforces that connection to our, our fans and our audience when we make a connection beyond it being 
just a dragon or just yes. a painting or because like even sometimes a painting at a convention I've had um I remember this one well I'm I'm really blown out here the lighting changed on me <laughs> uh, hello son I remember there was uh this one convention where somebody walked up and they were looking at this painting and it looked like they were gonna like cry yep yep and I'm like um, are you okay? Is there like, what can I do? Mm. There was something that they just saw in the painting that just reminded them of something else in their life. And they had this yeah. like really instant connection to it. Yeah. And it wasn't, you know, that's not something that I can create intentionally. Yeah. Because I did something that like, I was expressing my own view, but they saw something else in the painting yeah. that gave them something that I couldn't have given them otherwise. Like I gave them something a little bit more and that is so much more than I could really have ever hoped for. Yes. Seeing their face and they looked like they had kind of tears in their eyes, but they looked- Oh yeah, no, I've had the Insta tears before. Yeah, that's so just incredible. Yeah, like I can't say that I didn't duck underneath the table to like- Right? (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. I had, uh, this is gonna make me cry. I had a guy come by, it was at NDK. And he came by and I have, I have these tiered um, shelves that have, you know, the prints in them. And he walked by and he clutched his neck and he said, oh my God, that's the piece. And he looked at me and he went, oh my God, you're the artist. And I'm like, what, what did, what did I do? <laughs> he holds up his, his fiance had bought him one of my keychains and had turned it into a pendant. And that's how she proposed to him. And he like burst into tears and I burst into tears. And the fact that I was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? So I ended up giving him a set of the prints as a wedding present. And, but it was, it was, it was so, can you just, it was so incredible. You know, I'm like, somebody used my artwork to propose. That's like, that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, I, yeah, it's incredible. It, and, and as you said to, you know, we paint it because we like it. We paint it because we have an emotional response and things like that. We paint what we love and what we know and, and what makes us, you know, feel good or, you know, the whole artist thing. Mm-hmm. But I think when we're so involved in painting what we want, we forget. And then and then just being locked in a house for 24 hours. You know, we don't we don't socialize much. We I don't, don't see you know, the outside world. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We you know, I've, I've got a few friends here and very few of them are artists, you know, where I live. So we forget like the emotional connection that other people can have with the work and have it be such an integral part of their lives. You know, I, I paint a painting and I feel the emotions of that painting while I'm painting it. And then once I'm done with it, like all good children, it has to grow up, move out of the house and make its own living and hopefully support me. So (laughs) once you finish the painting, yeah, (laughs) right. Yeah. It kind of becomes a product after that. And it's, it's not that we lose the emotional connection. It's that we're on to the next piece. You know, the next piece is always the best piece. Absolutely. There's no, there's no other choice. I mean, I've got 30,000 ideas in my head alone and, and that doesn't even include larger projects and stuff like that. So, you know, we kind of distance ourselves and forget, and you have to, you know, because you have those people, the negative people too, which I have a good story about that. Um, (laughs) So you have to kind of distance yourself from the work. And so to see somebody connect to it on a level that could be even deeper than your connection was when you painted it is incredible. And it's, it's, I, I decided a long time ago that I wanted to create artwork that made other people happy. Yeah. Um, and that's why I don't really paint big, mean, scary roar dragons. They're all very sweet. They're all very powerful, majestic. They're not scary roar dragons. And and to see that reflected back from people is has always been like awesome, just I beyond think, yeah. words. And that's what keeps me going to cons because <laughs> making and, those connections. I mean, it just happened to be this way, but we we're both kind of filling this area of dragon dumb, I guess. <laughs> where <laughs> I don't know how to just so like in you know like in pop culture, like there's like the Game of Thrones dragons, but they're like these really big like angry yeah. looking and a lot of dragons in movies are always portrayed to be like evil or the bad mm-hmm. guy that's out to kill everything and well they have been since the you know eighth ninth they century have, they were but, this sign of satan i mean come on like i know? i just always imagined them like the way that i see a lot of them is something that you know like like an animal can be very mm-hmm. strong and powerful but 
they can also be elegant and they can yes. be beautiful and like otherworldly and kind. Um, and intelligent. Between intelligence. Wise, yeah. Like they could be a friend, they could be a comrade. Mm -hmm. um, and so like, that's something that I always saw them as is what if they were better than just giant, like scary dumb animals. Yeah. yeah like, dumb like, animals. Yeah. To kill everything. So yes, that's kind of like, I'm glad that we're just like in that area because I think that's what also helps connect people is like, um, when I look on like my Instagram, I can see like the audience on there and 75% yeah, yeah. of them are women. And I, mm -hmm. it could be because I draw them a little bit more elegant and, you know, maybe as women, we like kind of connect to that a little, a little bit more on the feminine side, but like I have drawn the big scary dragons and like, at least at conventions when they come up to, when guys come up to like my booth, they'll usually look at the big scary dragons. They're like, Oh yeah, this is cool. Like, rah, rah. right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, so I did an outdoor show recently, and and I had my whole booth set up, and a guy came by and with his you know demure wife and daughter, and he's sitting there and he's standing in front of my work with you know his hands on his hips, looking uber masculine, going, "These aren't dragons; these are too girly. Your dragons are way too feminine. You need to draw more masculine dragons." And I was like, "Oh yeah, what the hell, dude!" Like, and he went on for like almost ten minutes telling me about how I had to draw masculine dragons. And then I was like, yeah, okay, well, you know, you don't want to be rude to anybody at a show. She's like, yeah, I'll think about it, whatever. And then he walked off. His daughter lingered. And the look on her face, I sat there and went, those are not for you, dude. Those are for her. Because <laughs> she was just in total awe. And then a few customers later, I had a girl come up. And, and another one where she was like almost in tears, completely in awe. And she picked up the blue dragon about to fly off with the... Um, the stars, the falling stars behind him. And she said, what, why did you paint this? What is the meaning of this piece? And I was like, well, he's, he's launching off. He's named, you know, star chaser. He's about to chase after the stars. And she looks at me, she's like, I just went through a horrible, horrible life experience. And I feel like this piece is telling me to chase my dreams. Um, and I looked at her and I said, it is. And yeah. she, you know, she <laughs> bought it without a problem, but you know, yeah. And, and I, I just remember, you know, you have that, that one guy that comes in and he's like, oh, you have to draw masculine. Draw, da, 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 da. And I'm like, it was they already exist There's it was the epitome of of and i don't like using this term very often because i think it's overused it was the absolute epitome of white male privilege like i'm sitting there going go in any direction and you can find big scary dragons for you and you can find artwork for you and you can and i'm like one of a small handful of dragon artists that paint them in a more feminine way leave me alone like just let us do our thing just, man. seriously it's not for you let other people have nice things. Go watch Rain of Fire. <laughs> it's, which I loved. And the dragons in that movie were fabulous. But yeah, they were big, dumb animals. And I don't do my dragons like that. And that's okay. There's plenty of that out there. And I don't yeah. want to be like everybody else, you know? And I think a lot of other artists kind of get caught up in the, well, I was told to do this because this is what people want. Mm -hmm. that's, that's where you start the cycle of creating things that aren't good. Like... You do Try them to. to they're not as good because you don't have the love in it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Anytime I've had to do something, be, this is why I don't take very many commissions at all. Same. Every I've time I do something today, that like, I don't. A few yeah. years. Yeah, they just they just don't come out as good because I don't have those emotional connections to it and things like that. So, yeah. I have to say that's. Uh, there was a little while where I was actually taking a lot of commissions and that was how I was making my, my money on the side. Cause I oh, it's a, it's a viable way of doing it. Absolutely. And there, you know, absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. Like for artists that do take commissions and that's just how they make their living, like props to them. Like I've, I've done that a few, few years and I know what it's like, but for me, I just kind of realized that I was just going through the motions and just making the work was subpar. I was just making artwork that I just didn't have a connection to. I didn't feel like I loved the character. Like I didn't, you know, whatever it was. Um, so I started restricting the type of commissions and people would mm -hmm. show their ideas and I would do them if I feel like yes. oh, this is really cool. I'm Very much so. It. But then after a certain point, we start to realize that we've got this 800 line list of like ideas that are art yeah. and, and you know, we're only alive for like a certain amount of time on this earth. So right. Why am I spending like days and days of my time, like doing something that I don't 
really want to do. And I realize that that's like, maybe not a common thing. Like I feel very, very lucky that I'm able to just create what I feel and yes. do the things exactly the way I want and have people find them because I know that that's not something that's very common for a lot of artists. Like a lot of artists are just yeah. there to produce what someone else tells them to do because right. they've got the skill set and someone else has the need and that's just where, you know, right. the line comes together. Yeah, or making what they think sells and things like that. I <laughs> I laugh when it comes up on on the other show we watch about the whole step one is stop giving a fuck. Sorry. But okay. I, I think that's, that's, <laughs> we're all adults. That, yes, that's something we're fortunate that we learned a long time ago. Like I never, I mean, in high school, I wanted to work for TSR because it was I mean, yeah, still we, TSR at the time. We still had that figured out though. You know, yeah. Yeah. But you know, t- the TSR and Magic the Gathering had like just come out when I was early in high school. Those were the outlets for fantasy artists. That was what you were supposed to go into doing. And I wanted to work for TSR, which created Dungeons and Dragons, uh, which was then bought out by Hasbro since then. And and I wanted to work. You know, I saw interviews with Todd Lockwood and and um, RK Post when they were still there, and that's what I wanted to do. And when they were bought out and and basically dissolved, and the art studios were dissolved, I was kind of like, I don't know what to like where I want to go now. What do I want to do now? Because that it's not even a thing anymore for artists to to go like a fantasy studio um and now it's all freelance stuff and i knew that i didn't want to do freelance so i was i was fortunate again to meet up with my mother-in-law to go into that fine art kind of category where it's all paint what you want you know instead of painting what you think other people want you to paint stuff like that so yeah so we're kind of moving from a production mindset to a fine artist mindset, which is mm-hmm. which is an area that dragons normally never belonged in. And so we were kind right. of like adventuring into a realm of art that like never really existed before. Not even that long ago, 10 years ago, right? Like, yeah, yeah. Like I mean, it's an area that's still pretty new in the art world. As far as fantasy goes. Yeah, as the fine art fantasy. world, the fine art world, you know, has has been doing it that way for a long time. But Again, fantasy, as you said, was always for production. It was always for products and, and things like that. And and now with the Uber geeks from the eighties growing up and having money, you know, people don't mind hanging dragon art in their house. Well now there's like spectrum fantastic art. Yes. Yeah, like there are exactly. huge books and there are pe- like legit fine artists with like dragons and other fantasy has been pulled into the realm of fine art and there's like these right. huge gorgeous paintings that you would you would never have seen master level of dragons and orcs and yeah like the the level of skill of a lot of these artists is incredible and they're starting to be accepted into i mean a lot of these galleries have to be kind of created for fine artists now like spectrum and such but the fact that they exist and there's huge collectors that go to these because it's like the paintings are amazing. The ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollar paintings that you would have never been able to sell twenty years ago. Exactly, like some of the paintings um, at the first Spectrum uh, live show that I went to. Um, I think uh, Donato was the the guest artist of that show. Oh, he's so he had, good. Like, he's he so had, good. I don't know if it was like a five thousand dollar painting or something, but he has some very very large paintings. And they mm-hmm. all sold within the first day. Like the collectors yeah. just went there and they're like this is exactly what Donato's I need in my house. Amazing. Yeah, and now people are also like okay with hanging dragons in their house. Like it's more acceptable. Like Yeah. I sold a lot of magnets my first couple of years because no one wanted to hang dragon art in the house, but they love dragons, so they put it on their refrigerator as a magnet, but they wouldn't buy prints. I sold a lot of magnets in the early days. Yeah. And yeah. and now it's like I mean, I've got all I don't know. For us, it wouldn't be anything weird to be hanging dragons in our house. But yeah, no, no. Here, let me see if I can tilt that up. That's my, so that's a, <laughs> that's a nine and a half foot Chinese dragon that I bought 20 something years ago. Right. How, how are we going to resist stuff like that? Exactly. Like- <laughs> exactly. So my whole wedding was dragons. Yeah. That's nothing new for me. Cool. We're, we're at an hour and 17 minutes. We have gone oh, cool. over. I was starting to wonder. I was like, hmm. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm glad your phone is still, uh, not dead. <laughs> yes. No, it should so, be. Good yeah. phone. Hey. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. 
Uh, so we should get wrapping this up. Um, I feel like we've covered a whole lot of stuff. Like, that holy cow. So fun. We yeah, could go definitely. on for hours, though. Like, I yes. know this. So Easily. It, Easily. we got to. We gotta cut it when we yep. know we've got it down. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, is there any last words you want to say to our patrons, or maybe just like as a general wrap up? Thanks for joining us. It was a lot of fun. Um, you can check out my work. Those of you that don't know me, dragonladyart.com. Literally, just Google Dragon Lady Art. It's all me. <laughs> yeah. I've Googled it several times, and I always find yes. it that way. <laughs> <laughs> or Carla Moreau. Also, Carla Moreau. Up. Yeah, that works too. Uh, that's usually how I pull up your page on Patreon. Um, mm -hmm. For anyone watching this, I am going to put all these links down in the comments as well. So you don't have cool. to try to cool. write them down really fast. They'll be all below. Um, my new my newest Oracle deck is out. So I now have two Oracle decks. Yeah. I'll be posting um, like matching tarot, car tarot uh, bags and cloths on my website within the next day to go with the Oracle deck. Um so if you're watching yeah. this on YouTube right now, um, once it goes public, that should the or Oracle deck and all that will be live by that yes. point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll be posted. Cool. Uh, and um, you can always just find me. Uh, Comma Crew is basically my online everything because my name is really long and nobody can spell it right. <laughs> so you can just search Comma Crew Art, or you can try spelling my name if you want to. If you want to be adventurous. See, so how come you picked Comma Crew Art? Uh, I needed something that could fit into social media, like oh. <laughs> Katie Cronenberg's. Like, there's always like a character limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could never fit Cronenberg's in there, and then people would spell it wrong. So, but I, what does that? What does the name mean? It doesn't. It's just my name, actually. Uh, so, Kamakuru, really? Mm -hmm, it's I just of, assumed it was like some like anime Japanese thing. I my know. Bad. Wow. It's very unfortunate <laughs> that it, it turned into that, but I just kept it anyways. Um, I took the first syllable of my first middle and last name. So Katie oh, Marie Kroonenbergs. Gotcha. M-A Marie and then C-R-O-O, -O, the crew part of Kroonenbergs and then changed okay. it to K-R-U because it looked better that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I totally just, thought it was like a Japanese thing. It's just bad. made out of my name, but just like nice. shortened into like a little condensed. That's cool. Word. Yeah, yeah. And also, I Googled that word and it didn't exist anywhere else. So I was like, well... It's a website name, right? And easy cool. to remember website name and all that. Nice. So I was like, it's a branding thing. But yeah, yeah. yeah. You everybody, everybody called me Dragon Lady every time I did a show. Because there was no other fantasy artist where I lived. Like, southern New Mexico, it was all southwestern. So people would be like, oh my god, the Dragon Lady is here. And I'm like, I'm going to own that. That's there you are. Mine. There's you. So, yeah. I'm surprised yeah. it hadn't been taken yet. Like, I expected, yeah, I expected it to be gone, but... And we yeah. could dive into a whole long other conversation yes. about names and stuff. So business and branding cool. and yeah, that'll be for next time. We'll do <laughs> business and branding next time. Business and branding. Take a note. Yes. All right, everyone. We're going to wrap cool. it up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone for joining on the stream today. And uh, there will be another one next month. Um, if it's hosted by me, it will probably be uh, not Carla again. Uh, but in the future, you know, once we do one of these every month, I'm probably gonna, we're probably gonna meet up again, like some of the same, because these cool. are people I know, like Carla's a good friend of mine, so Yay. it makes sense. <laughs> All right, everyone, we're gonna go. Thanks for Thanks. joining. Thanks. Bye. Bye, guys.